Hello, I am Professor Sims, and this video is going to be talking about infections of the digestive system. This is the eighth of ten lessons included in my pathogenic microbiology course. If you are a student currently enrolled in this course, please consult my syllabus and the Moodle site for assignments and other course-related information. The learning objectives for this lesson are going to include describing the major anatomical features and normal microbiota of the digestive system, signs and symptoms of infections of the digestive system, major characteristics of oral disease, uh, common bacterial, viral, protozoal, and hemolithic infections of the gastrointestinal tract. The gastrointestinal tract is a long tube lined with mucous membranes and composed of the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, and the anus. The GI tract processes food into nutrients, absorbs nutrients and water in the blood, and eliminates waste. A membranous covering called the peritoneum surrounds and protects most of the GI tract organs. The peritoneal cavity is the space between the organs and the peritoneum. When we eat, we chew and moisten the food in the mouth before swallowing, and then digestion begins in the mouth with the salivary enzymes. Muscle contractions, called peristalsis, moves moistened food down the esophagus, which is the muscular tube at the back of the throat, and it moves it down to the stomach. The stomach secretes hydrochloric acid and a protein catabolizing enzyme called pepsin. These chemicals further the chemical digestion of food as it is held in the stomach. The stomach gradually moves partially digested food into the small intestine. The small intestine is so named because it is only about 3 centimeters in diameter, though it is about 6 meters long. The small intestine has three subdivisions the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum, and these are responsible for most of the, di the digestion and absorption of nutrients. The internal surface of the small intestine folds into millions of finger-like projections called villi, and each of the villi is lined with cells having a cytoplasmic membrane convoluted into microvilli. Intestinal peristalsis moves the undigested and unabsorbed material into the large intestine, which is also known as the colon. The colon is about 7 centimeters in diameter and about 1.5 meters long. And finally, after the food leaves the colon, the remaining undigested material called feces are passed into the rectum. After viewing this animation, you will be able to describe the pathway and events that occur during digestion within the digestive system and its supporting glands. Digestion starts in the mouth, also known as the oral cavity, where mastication occurs. This is the process of chewing and mechanically breaking down the food bolus. Chemical digestion starts when the salivary glands release saliva into the oral cavity. Saliva is rich in amylase, an enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates. After the bolus has been broken down adequately, swallowing begins. The food bolus passes through the pharynx and into the esophagus. Peristalsis, which is rhythmic contractions of the muscle layers, pushes the bolus down the esophagus. The bolus passes into the stomach through the lower esophageal sphincter. This sphincter normally remains closed, preventing reflux of the stomach contents. The stomach is divided into anatomical regions, the cardia, fundus, body, and antrum. The muscular outlet of the stomach is called the pylorus. The surface of the lumen is covered in folds called rugae. Peristaltic contractions continue in the stomach, churning and mixing the food bolus with hydrochloric acid and the digestive enzyme pepsin. Neural and hormonal stimulation causes the release of pepsin by the stomach, which starts the chemical digestion of proteins. This helps reduce the bolus to a fluid-like substance called chyme. When the chyme reaches its proper softness, the pylorus opens and the chyme is slowly released into the first portion of the small intestine, called the duodenum. Peristaltic contractions continue in the duodenum. It is within the duodenum that the chyme mixes with pancreatic juice and bile. The process of digestion causes neural and hormonal stimulation of the pancreas to release pancreatic juice. Specialized pancreatic cells produce the pancreatic juice. The juice contains digestive enzymes and bicarbonate. 
The major digestive enzymes are amylase, which digests carbohydrates, lipase, which digests fats, and protease, which digests proteins. When pancreatic cells release the juice, it flows through tiny pancreatic ducts, which lead to the main pancreatic and accessory pancreatic ducts. Then, the juice is released into the duodenum through the major and minor papillae, where it mixes with the chyme. In order to protect the pancreas, protease is released in an inactive form and is activated once it reaches the duodenum. Bicarbonate within the juice acts to neutralize the acidic chyme, which creates a favorable environment for the digestive enzymes to function. Located above and in front of the pancreas, the liver has many roles, including the maintenance of metabolic homeostasis. The liver maintains this because it receives most of the blood flow via the portal venous system from the small and large intestines. This blood contains nutrients absorbed during digestion. The liver processes these nutrients and vitamins and helps detoxify the blood passing through the portal venous system. Another role of the liver is the production of bile, which is a liquid that contains bile salts and other substances. Bile salts emulsify fat within the small intestine. Liver cells, known as hepatocytes, secrete the constituents of bile into tiny bile canaliculi, which flows into larger hepatic ductules that eventually combine to form the right and left hepatic ducts. Bile then flows into the common hepatic duct and cystic duct, where it enters the gallbladder to be concentrated and stored. During digestion, the gallbladder contracts and pushes the bile through the cystic duct and common bile duct where they join the pancreatic duct at the hepatopancreatic ampulla. The bile then empties into the duodenum through the major papilla. The bile mixes with the chyme and helps to digest fat. The chyme continues to mix with the digestive enzymes as it moves through the duodenum and into the jejunum, the second portion of the small intestine. Nutrients from the digested food are absorbed into the bloodstream in the jejunum. The bolus moves through the jejunum and reaches the ileum, where there is more nutrient absorption. The unabsorbed portion of the bolus passes out of the ileum and into the large intestine through the ileocecal valve. The first portion of the large intestine is called the cecum. The main function of the large intestine is to absorb water and solutes, such as fatty acids, which help concentrate and form the stool. The bolus is pushed by a peristaltic wave up and through the ascending colon, which passes through the first major bend in the colon, the hepatic flexure. The bolus is now pushed through the transverse colon, and then travels through the second major bend, the splenic flexure. Then the bolus moves down the descending colon and into the sigmoid colon, before entering the rectum. The formed stool enters and is stored in the upper portion of the rectum. The anus contains anal sphincter muscles that remain tightly closed until neural input causes the rectum to widen. Then the stool descends, the anal sphincter relaxes, and defecation occurs. The gastrointestinal canal is characterized by constant movement. And there's mucus that protects the GI tract, and you have your normal microbiota that live in the gut and the colon. Um, and there's also, it's also a pretty harsh environment, especially in the stomach, where you have the hydrochloric acid production, so the pH is really low. And all of these things help to prevent colonization by bacteria, by pathogens. Figure 24.5 is showing the structure of the small intestinal wall and the villi and microvilli. The microvilli of the small intestine increases surface area of the uh, small intestine, which aids in absorption of nutrients and water. Localized inflammation of the GI tract. This is going to be your gastritis, enteritis, gastroenteritis, hepatitis, colitis. And what happens is you have damage to the epithelial cells of the colon or uh, the, go the goblet cells or your villi. These can lead to dysentery. Now you have food foodborne illness is uh, commonly associated with this inflammation. And this has to do with infections that originate with um, ingested food or contaminated water.
There are several accessory digestive organs, including the tongue, the teeth. Also, you have your liver, gallbladder, pancreas. Uh, the teeth and the tongue are important accessory organs of the mouth that masticate food into small bits, while the salivary glands secrete saliva amylase. Amylase it aids in the digestion of starch. Teeth have two functions in chewing. The incisors and the canines at the front of the mouth tear food. The molars near the back of the mouth grind food. The surface of a tooth is enamel. Enamel is a hard calcium phosphate mineral. And then a softer material called dentin composes the body of a tooth. And then this dentin expo extends as one or more roots into the gingiva or the gums and then uh, the bone of the jaw. The interior of a tooth contains soft pulp with blood vessels and nerves. Tooth decay is shown here in figure 24.7, and it occurs in different stages. First, you have plaque that forms on your teeth. So that's plaque is just a bacterial biofilm that develops on your teeth. And the bacteria in the plaque produce acids. And then the acids gradually dissolve the enamel on the surface of the tooth. And then eventually it will start to degrade the dentin as well on the inside. Eventually, if you are not... Uh, treating this bacterial infection, you'll have a lesion that can reach all the way down into the pulp of the tooth, which causes an abscess. Dental caries, tartar, and gingivitis, these are all generally caused by biofilms or overgrowths of Streptococcus and Actinomyces bacteria. So this figure here is showing tartar that is uh, visible at the base of the teeth. You have darker deposits up on the crowns up here that's also tartar you have a tooth over here that's only having a very small amount of decay but it is there uh, this part here is showing an x-ray of this tooth here but you can see more decay is actually happening in, on the inside in the dentin so what they have done here is that they've actually removed part of the crown so they can get down into that tooth decay that is hidden and then removing all of that decay allows for the, it to then be filled so they replace part of the crown with a filling. Gingivitis is uh, where you have infection of the gums with uh, bacterial biofilms. It's usually again caused by species of streptococcus, actinomyces, and also can be caused by Bifuromonas species. And this is a, a form of periodontitis. So the figure 2410 is showing the progression of periodontal disease. You have healthy gums that are not bleeding and they're holding the teeth firmly in place. The early stages of gingivitis, uh, you have microbial infections that are making the gums uh, inflamed and irritated with occasional bleeding, maybe only when you're brushing your teeth. Then as that progresses, you have receding gum lines. Part of the tooth that are normally covered up are exposed. In advanced periodontitis, you have the infection spreads to ligaments and bone tissues that actually support the teeth. So your teeth are no longer being held firmly in the jaw, and that's when you can have tooth loss. Figure 2411 here is showing a case of acute necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. This is commonly known as trench mouth. So this is pretty advanced it, well, it can become pretty advanced. This is actually kind of a mild case. What you have is inflammation of the gums, receding gum line, and you have teeth that are no longer being firmly anchored into the jaw. Herpes simplex 1 can cause lesions of the mouth and the throat. This is called herpetic gingivostomatitis. So in figure 2412, you see a cold sore that's very typical of herpes virus. But in the second part of this figure here, something that is maybe a little lesser known, where you have the herpes virus that causes this acute herpetic gingivostomatitis. You see this inflammation in the roof of the mouth, lesions in the throat. Oral thrush is a fungal infection. We talked about this in... Uh, previous lesson, this is an overgrowth of candida yeast, and when it occurs in the vagina, it leads to yeast infection. When it occurs in the mouth, this is thrush. Mumps is a viral infection of the salivary glands. Figure 2412 is showing the characteristic swelling associated with the mumps. This here is just a short list of 
many causes of gastrointestinal illness. So th that's really just a fancy way of saying that um, these are your most common causes of foodborne illness, food poisoning, and other types of GI tract infections. You have your salmonellas, your staphylococcus, shigella, E. coli, helicobacter, clostridium, bacillus, yersinia, and of course cholera. Usually treatment for these is going to involve uh, supportive therapies, antibiotics, things like that. But mainly your biggest concern is dehydration from all of the diarrhea. Sometimes you may have to get IV fluids. It is important to be careful over using antibiotics, especially in the case of GI tract, because they, they like to prescribe broad spectrum antibiotics for these things. But that does come with the risk of acquiring C. difficile infections. C. difficile is a rather difficult to treat antibiotic resistant infection. So this is figure 24.16 that is emphasizing the, the fact that so many GI diseases are caused by food poisoning and it is showing a nice schematic here of what is and what is not a safe temperature to use and store food. Your lower temperatures are good for food storage, things that go from about negative 20 to 4 degrees Celsius. So this is freezer temperature and refrigerator temperature. And then up here, it does show the safe temperatures at which you should cook your food, depending on what kind of food it is. If the food is already cooked and you're just holding it like in a, in a warming oven or uh, under a heat lamp, then about 60 degrees Celsius is good for that. Most of your red meats should be cooked at at least 63 degrees. Eggs need to be cooked at higher temperatures, at least 71. And then your poultry, your chicken, turkey, things like that. Even reheating leftover turkey or leftover uh, Thanksgiving dressing or stuffing, that needs to be at a high temperature, at least 165 degrees Fahrenheit or 74 degrees Celsius to prevent food poisoning. Salmonella, enterica, certain strains or serotypes of this can be uh, the causative agent of typhoid fever. Typhoid is much more severe than your regular salmonella food poisoning. This figure here, 2418, is showing salmonella that is infecting the intestinal epithelial cells. And in the case of typhoid fever, it actually changes the host cell cytoskeleton, and that induces the host cell to have replication of cells that are kind of physically deformed. And it even can lead to a situation where the host immune system starts to attack its own cells. Staph aureus settles into the small intestine and it can cause, and it's not just staph aureus, many of these foodborne illnesses cause similar symptoms like inflammation, swelling, cramping, diarrhea, dehydration, fever, uh, malaise, right? General nausea, vomiting, shigella. Again, symptoms include diarrhea, fever, stomach cramps. This is a food poisoning that usually resolves in about a week, either with or without antibiotic treatment. Figure 2417 here is showing the red and white blood cells in a stool sample with a patient that has shigellosis. And the increased prevalence of white blood cells is very indicative of a bacterial infection. Clostridium difficile is a really, really important and significant hospital-acquired infection, a nosocomial infection. And there are lots of different severities and a wide range of symptoms. You can have C. difficile that just gives you diarrhea, or you can have C. difficile that kills you. Um, so this, this uh, graphic here is showing some of the, the impact and the risk factors for C. difficile. There are about 500,000 cases of C. difficile every year in the, in the U.S. C. difficile comes back. It recurs in one in five patients that have contracted it. It does cause approximately 15,000 deaths per year. People that are taking antibiotics, especially broad-spectrum antibiotics, are seven to ten times more likely to contract C. difficile while they are in the hospital or while they are still on the antibiotic course. In other words, 
you've started taking the antibiotics, but you haven't finished the whole course of medication, that's that's the danger zone for C. difficile. Being in the hospital or in like in other healthcare settings, like a nursing home or a clinic, uh, increases your risk. More than 80% of cases that have become fatal occurred in people that were over the age of 65. This is an overview of infection with the Clostridium difficile bacterium, commonly referred to as C. difficile or simply C. diff. The human digestive tract is home to an estimated 500 to 1,000 different species of microorganisms, most of which are harmless or even helpful and live together in harmony. But if something upsets the balance of these bacteria, such as treatment with antibiotics or cancer chemotherapy, certain harmful organisms can multiply out of control and cause illness. Clostridium difficile infection, or CDI for short, is an example of this. CDI is a bacterial infection that causes diarrhea, which can sometimes be debilitating, and other intestinal symptoms by inflaming the colon, causing something known as colitis. When the gut's beneficial bowel bacteria are disrupted, the C. diff bacterium can multiply, producing toxins that damage the bowel and cause intestinal symptoms. In very severe cases, C. diff infection can even result in death. A person might harbor the C. diff bacteria in their gut but do not become sick because the beneficial bacteria in their intestines keep it in check. However, there are a few risk factors that, when present, might, to varying degrees, increase the chance of contracting C. diff infection. These include being older than 65 years of age, taking antibiotics, especially over a prolonged period of time, having a severe underlying illness, being in an immune-compromised state, receiving chemotherapy to treat cancer, taking proton pump inhibitors to reduce stomach acid, having had a previous episode of CDI, having a prolonged hospital or care home stay because there you have an increased risk of being exposed to the bacterium. A recurrent case of CDI can be defined as a return of symptoms with lab confirmation of C. diff infection after successful treatment the first time. Most of these recurrences occur within one to eight weeks. In other words, recurrence means experiencing more than one episode even after the previous episode has been cured. This is a major challenge, as recurrent CDI can cause a large burden of disease to patients and society. Unfortunately, C. diff is a resourceful bacterium. It forms spores that are resistant to antibiotics and to many alcohol-based cleaning agents, which allows the bacterium and its spores to last on surfaces for months. Each episode of CDI increases the likelihood of a subsequent episode. Many patients can experience multiple occurrences over the course of their stay in a healthcare facility or have to return repeatedly to a hospital for treatment because it recurs. Approximately one in four patients who experience one episode of C. diff will have a recurrence. Of this group, about 45% will experience another episode, and of those patients, 60% will experience further bouts of the infection. CDI is the most common cause of infectious diarrhea in hospitals and long-term care facilities. In fact, patients often develop the infection after going to the hospital or other health care setting to receive treatment for another ailment. This is because the C. diff bacterium and its spores are found in high amounts in feces of infected people, who can then spread the infection to surfaces such as food or other objects especially if they don't wash their hands properly after using the toilet, and if proper cleaning protocols are not in place in healthcare facilities. A person might not have any symptoms and still be able to spread C. diff bacteria. Others could become infected if they touch these contaminated surfaces, then do not wash their hands thoroughly, and subsequently ingest the bacteria or spores. Despite the efforts hospitals go through to combat C. diff, many are still experiencing outbreaks. Some hospitals have incorporated novel technology to help clean rooms, such as using ultraviolet lights that kill bacteria left after conventional cleaning, while others have greatly enhanced infectious control measures that include diligent hand-washing programs. However, 
Effective treatment for C. diff remains an important element in managing the challenges associated with these infections in the hospital. The most important aspect of the infection is the profound impact it has on a patient's quality of life. In addition to the painful physical effects and lifestyle consequences, C. diff might also have a significant emotional impact. It can be as uncomfortable to discuss as it is to manage. The most commonly used treatments for C. diff are antibiotics. Since C. diff is intrinsically resistant to many types of antibiotics, which is why it survives when antibiotics kill other bacteria, researchers have been looking for more effective treatments. Studies looking at therapies to address the role of the immune system in treating or preventing C. diff infection are underway. One promising option, when other treatments fail, is fecal transplantation, which works by fixing the balance of microorganisms in the gut by introducing bacteria from a non-infected person's gut. If you or someone you know is suffering from Clostridium difficile infection, there are resources available to help ease the situation. Speak to your health care provider about available treatments, including those that are newer, and address the issue of recurrence so that you can find optimal care. I'm Dr. James Gray on behalf of the Gastrointestinal Society. Thanks for watching. C. difficile colonizes the mucous membranes of the colon, and it's able to do this because the normal microbiota that would normally compete with attachment sites and uh, antagonize the C. difficile are depleted due to antibiotics. C. difficile has toxins that trigger an immune response from the host. And what happens is it ends up migrating into the bloodstream, which makes it a systemic infection that infects the body. And over time, you have increased inflammation and you have the dead skin cells and the dead mucoid membrane cells. They develop a pseudomembrane. So then you have this pseudomembrane that's covering the lining of your gastrointestinal tract and it leads to the inability to absorb nutrients and fluids and things from your food and the water that you drink. And that's what eventually can lead to death. Vibrio cholera is the causative agent of cholera. Cholera is a severe and often fatal diarrheal illness. So figure 19 is kind of showing some information about cholera. You have cholera is a fecal orally transmitted disease. So it comes from contaminated water usually. It happens a lot when you have areas where they don't have proper latrines or sewage. So you have human waste that's going directly into the drinking water. Here in the middle here you have a cholera patient that's receiving intravenous fluids. That's going to be very, very important because the, the diarrhea is so severe that you have a risk of dehydration to the point of death. And over here, finally, you have the scanning electron micrograph of Vibrio cholera. It shows that it is um, its cell morphology is Vibrio. It's kind of like a little uh, curved rod. This infographic here is talking about different strains of E. coli that are pathogenic and uh, they cause gastrointestinal infections. Uh, you don't really need to know in great detail all of the symptoms and treatments and things for all of these. I just wanted you to see that E. coli is a very good example of a bacteria that has different strains that are, they're the same species, but they're different varieties of the same species. So it's kind of like a subspecies or what they call a strain. You can also have serotypes. Again, that's kind of like a subspecies of bacteria. And you have some E. coli that are normal flora and they're not pathogenic. You have other E. coli, again, same species, that are opportunistically pathogenic. And then you have these strains of E. coli that are all pathogenic. You have enterotoxigenic E. coli, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, enteroinvasive E. coli, enteropathogenic E. coli, enteroaggregative E. coli and then what they call diffusely adhering E. coli. These are all pathogens of the gastrointestinal system, and they're all strains of the same species. Helicobacter pylori, this is what causes peptic ulcers in the stomach or in the, uh, in the small intestine. Helicobacter uh, decreases mucus production, and that's what causes the peptic ulcers. This is a table that's comparing common viral gastroenteritis 
So this is, it's comparing the, the type of disease, the pathogen that causes, the signs and symptoms, how it's transmitted, how it is diagnosed, and if there is a vaccine for it. And it's uh, for the rotavirus, norovirus, and astroviruses. Hepatitis is caused by different unrelated viruses. So you have hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, hepatitis D, and hepatitis E. Now, hepatitis A and hepatitis E are both uh, GI infections that are contracted via consumption of contaminated food or water. Figure 24-26 is just showing the different, the, the different types of hepatitis as far as how they differ in their structure. Hep A is a non-enveloped, single-stranded RNA-positive virus. Hep B is a double-stranded DNA-enveloped virus. Hep C is an enveloped single-stranded RNA virus. Um, D is an enveloped single-stranded RNA negative. And then E is a non-enveloped single-stranded RNA positive. Hepatitis A is transmitted uh, via food and water that's contaminated, so that does infect the gastrointestinal tract. Hepatitis B is something that is usually transmitted through the skin or through bodily fluids like blood, saliva, or semen. It's also a sexually transmitted infection. Hepatitis C is transmitted through direct contact with bodily fluids. So again, with um, it's another sense, sexually transmitted infection. It also can be transmitted via sharing of intravenous needles. Hepatitis D is usually, again, a puncture wound or infected blood. And then hepatitis E is the other one that is transmitted via contaminated food or water. This table is outlining the characteristics of different protozoal infections of the gastrointestinal tract. We're going to go through some of these. Ascaris lumbricoides eggs are transmitted through contaminated food or water. So the eggs are in the water and you ingest the water and it, the eggs make it into your intestine and that's where they hatch. And then the larvae that grow from the eggs travel all the way up into your lungs and they end up in your pharynx where you swallow them and then return them back to the intestines to mature. It's a really creepy, gross kind of form of this, uh, you know how salmon migrate back to where they were born to reproduce? That's what these guys do in your gastrointestinal tract. Nicator americanus and achillostoma. These are going to be things that have larvae that originate in dog or cat feces, and they actually can penetrate intact skin. And they end up traveling all the way to your lungs, and you swallow them, and they end up in your intestines where they reproduce. So these are the guys that when you have a new kitten or a new puppy, you take it to the vet and they test it for worms. These are the worms. And those worms can dig into your skin and end up in your lungs and eventually reproduce in your intestines. Enterobias vermicularis. These are nematodes. They cause enterobiasis. Enterobiasis can be rather severe causative agents of rectal itching. So this is kind of funny but um, these pinworms are not going to cause you a lot of issues, except for the fact that they give you itchy butt. And it can be really severe rectal itching. Trichurus trichuriae, uh, this is transmitted via soil or fecal contamination. And what happens with these helmets is that you ingest them, and then the eggs will travel to your intestine, and they hatch and they develop larvae. The larvae mature and attach to the walls of your colon, your colon and your cecum. And they just live there and continue to reproduce. So figure 2435 is showing an, an adult whipworm. Uh, that's their common name is a whipworm. It is a soil transmitted parasite. It is really kind of on the larger scale compared to some of these other helmets, uh, especially, especially if you compare them to the pinworms or... Uh, the Nicator americanos. They are going to be much smaller than your Ascaris or helmets. The Ascaris are going to be much bigger, but um, these are pretty big, a couple of inches long. So you definitely can see them with the naked eye, and they're, they're kind of big. 
the eggs, uh, they end up in your intestines and they kind of take up resonance there. And over here, this figure is showing what is known as rectal prolapse. This is something that happens with whipworm infections that have gone untreated. Essentially, what happens is your rectum is no longer attached to your colon and it exits your body. The rectum prolapses and actually comes out of your anus. Figure 2436 uh, showing some tapeworms. Tapeworms come from undercooked food, usually undercooked meat. You also can get tapeworms from the fecal oral transmission route. So again, contaminated water usually. This figure is showing on the left the tapeworms that are found within smooth muscle cells. So these ones are pretty small. On the right, you can see a tapeworm. It's actually kind of wrapped in, spiraled around itself. This is a tapeworm in meat. And this coiled appearance is very typical of tapeworm larvae. Fluke worms, these are transmitted through aquatic plants or fish. You have liver flukes. Um, these interfere with the bile ducts. And you have intestinal flukes that attach to the intestinal epithelium. Figure 2438 is showing a liver fluke that infects the bile ducts. That's this guy over here on the left. And this one over here is an intestinal fluke. So that is going to do it for Lesson 8. Thank you guys very much for watching. Please check the description of this video for other videos that are related to these topics. Make sure to do your reading and leave your questions for me in the comments section below.